started on time. What's that? I am live. We'll find out, won't we? <laughs> I'm at least on. We'll leave it at that. But uh, yeah. Well, welcome everyone. It's good to have you here again tonight. Does everybody remember what we just came from with Acts chapter 11? Yeah, that was right. That was the number of the chapter. If you remember, Peter had a dream in chapter 10, and God showed him through this vision that all of a sudden, God's gospel was for everyone, and Peter was to understand that. And so Peter had to explain his actions to the people in Jerusalem because they didn't really believe that God, or didn't really understand, let's say, that, oh, see, they want front row seats. That's going to be another $20 for the better seats for the mo It's like a baseball game. You just work your way up. <laughs> this way I can point. <laughs> can be good. All right. And if you remember then, the church of Antioch came and Barnabas came, and they just wanted to make sure what was being done was of God. And God used Peter to make that happen. And the gospel, it had been spreading wildly, and now it took on a whole new level because all of a sudden the Jewish people fully grasped that anyone could come into the kingdom of God. Amen? Anyone of any type, of any background, all were welcome into the kingdom of Jesus Christ. And so we're going to start here in Acts chapter 12. And so, Lord, we ask in your wonderful name, that you will help us hear the truth that comes forth from Acts 12 that you want us to learn. Not just for our own head knowledge, God, but that it may sink deep into our spirits and that we may learn from what you have for us. In your name, amen. All right. So this is the last chapter for a while that we're really going to hear a lot about Peter. This is the transition from Peter to Paul and what's going on. About 10 years, about a decade. Yep, just about a decade. Uh, it's, there's not an exact time frame, but from what we understand of the time, uh, of that way the Herod went into rule and such, that uh, it was about a decade or so at this time, which I know it doesn't seem like a lot. A lot's happened in 10 years, hasn't it? So God was moving. It encourages us what can happen here in 10 years, huh? Amen. By 2030, man, we might own this whole street. Just kidding. All right, that's not our goal. So let's see if anybody's watching. Candace, good to have you with us. Valerie, good to have you with us. <laughs> All right. It was about the time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church. Now, this is really important. Really, but interestingly important. Do you remember back who the king was when Jesus was born and he tried to, or he took a bunch of the infants and had them killed because he was quite frankly jealously pridefully crazy Herod was that the same person as this Herod no this will be interesting to you Herod was a name used for a family much like there were many Caesars but one Caesar Remember that in Roman, you may, if you've read Rome, uh, this year Rome, there were many Caesars. So it was Caesar Augustus was one of the great leaders, but he was known as Caesar. And so here it was King Herod the Great was the one who was king when Jesus was born and who did that horrific deed of killing who knows the multitudes of small infants at that time. Now, after him came Herod Antipas. Has anybody yet? Oh, so again, that first Herod was the one that talked to the Magi and everything like that. Herod Antipas, he was the one that Jesus stood before at his trial. Remember, Jesus was sent to Pilate, and then Pilate said, ah, I don't know if I want to deal with Jesus, I'm going to send him to Herod. And so Herod Antipas was the Herod that he sent him to. Now later on, in, or just in chapter 10, we read about Caesarea Philippi. That was named after the next Herod, Herod Philip. It was named after him. Actually, it was Herod Philip II at the time. And he built Caesarea Philippi, which is where what happened in Acts 10, the vision and all that happened. Now it brings us to modern present day of Acts chapter 12. It's a fellow named Herod Agrippa. And this Herod we're going to read about, and by the end of this chapter... This Herod, who thought he was all-powerful, prideful, and in full control, 
We're going to discover who truly is in control because God is going to take his life. And we'll look at that at the end of this chapter. And just as a reference point, in Acts chapter 25, Herod Agrippa II will be who Paul stands before. So um, I'm going to quiz you now. No, I'm just kidding. But just remember, Herod the Great, Herod Antipas, Herod Philip II, and then uh, Herod Agrippa, Herod Agrippa II. So you all got that? All right. Three weeks from now, I'm going to quiz you on that, and we'll see how you do. All right. Whoever gets it all right gets communion first. So... Wow, you call the bishop on that one. That's pretty terrible. All right. That being said, so now you know who Herod was. Oh, one thing you can know is all the Herods, to one degree or another, were crazy. Like, I mean, like this Herod we're about to talk about, he killed most of his wives and many of his sons because he didn't want them taking over power from him. And he was not alone. These men were horrific human beings. Now, the Herod, the Herod we're talking about, Herod the Great, he built great projects. And if you go to Israel, you'll see Masada, which is a beautiful thing that was built. But they were creative, but they were truly wicked, wicked line of men to some degree or another. And so, like any politician, and I want you to kind of think of Herod right now as a politician. It was about this time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church intending to persecute them one more little background this herod had jewish roots whether you want to call him a full jew or not but his family line was connected to the jews so when it comes between the jews and the christians which side is he going to take his jewish roots and so he persecuted the church he had james the brother of john the apostle put to death with the sword and this is another way to say that he was beheaded. So James was beheaded because he wanted to persecute the Christians for the sheer purpose of wanting to appease the Jews so they would like him. It's not like modern politicians. They would never do anything to appease the crowd and hurt people, would they? No. From all parties, from all countries, leaders often are filled with pride and their goal is to get the crowds behind them and to appease the right people. And so after he killed James, Herod was like, well, the people love this. They love me. My approval rating is going through the roof right now. You know what I'm going to do? If I killed James and they loved it, let me tell you who I'm going after next. And even without looking, who do you think would be the top dog to go after? Peter, right? <clears throat> because Paul wasn't around this area at this time. So he, didn't, he, he hadn't done the big awesome things we know that he's about to do. And so he thinks, well, if they were happy about James, well, then darn it, I'm going to go and I'm going to go get Peter. And so in verse 3, when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter also. This happened during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. <laughs> After arresting him, he put him in prison, handing him over to be guarded by four squads of four soldiers each. <clears throat> Excuse me. Herod intended to bring him out for public trial. Now let's just take a moment and think about if you're Peter. Those apostles were a close-knit group, weren't they? They traveled with Jesus. They experienced incredible things together. They were sent out two by two. They saw miracles. They saw demons exercised. They saw the dead raised. He had grown close, I'm sure, to all the other apostles. And here's James, someone he cared about. His life is taken in a swift, swift swing of a sword. What is Peter thinking right now? being chained. Now, chain doesn't mean handcuffs. It probably was about a six-foot chain or something on each arm that he was chained to both people, to both soldiers or right next to him. And you notice there were four squads of four soldiers each that would rotate in. Why did they rotate? They wouldn't get tired, right? So you always had an alert soldier ready there because if Peter escapes, what happens to the soldiers in Roman times? They got killed. So you weren't going to let Peter escape by any means. And they had probably heard the stories that we read about earlier. Who was it that escaped from jail away back in chapter 4? Remember? Peter and John. They 
they had been set free from jail. And so my guess is the reason there was such a strong guard watching over them is because these stories were circulating how they had gotten out of jail miraculously. And so here he is guarded. What are you thinking if you're Peter? Right? Because, I mean, it'd be wonderful to say, just as God saved the Hebrew children and Daniel, he will save me. But that's hard to pray when your close confidant and friend just got beheaded by the same person and the same group of people, right? So how could Peter know what's going to happen? Do you think he thought he was going to die? That was a trick question. He knew he was not going to die. And I will give $10 to anybody who can tell me why that's the case. It'll be Valerie's $10, but I'll still give you that $10. No? Well, faith is part of it. Yeah, faith's part of it. Let me share with you a scripture back from John 21. Back when Peter, remember when Peter and Jesus had that conversation where Jesus restored him and he said, how much do you love me, Peter? And um, I love you and it would then do this and so forth. There was that interaction. Well, after he said, feed my lambs, care for my sheep. After that, Jesus says this to Peter. I tell you the truth, Peter. When you were younger... You dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you to where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to identify the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. And he said, follow me. Peter has not grown old yet. Is he a little older? Yes. But he is not old by Jewish standards at this point. And if Jesus tells you, you're not going to die until you're old. You can count on dying when? You're when you're old. Does any power on earth have the ability to stop the words of Jesus Christ spoken over you? No. And so while he may have questioned a bit, I would just simply make the argument, though certainly I wasn't there, but I would make the argument that I believe Peter, in faith, in the words of what Christ said, knew that this was not going to be his time to die. Now, he may have thought he was going to be beaten and battered and almost to the point of death, but he knew he still had a work to do for God. Now, after all, what's that? He had a fearless faith. That's why your word faith was right, but it was faith in the words that Jesus spoke to him. Now, let me ask you, why would God allow James to be killed and not Peter? Right. There is no definite answer. So if you guess, if you're guess, it's very unlikely I can say you're wrong. Okay. Because it, it's a guess. Now, does that mean God loved Peter more? No. Does it mean that Peter was more useful to God? And let's just, I'll use the quotes, better Christian than James was. So it has nothing to do with their spirituality. Has nothing to do with God's love for them. Do you think the church was praying for James the way they prayed for Peter? So you don't think that it was a faith thing. Because that's what some teachers teach today, isn't it? Some teachers teach that if this doesn't happen or that doesn't happen, the thing you're praying for, the problem is your faith isn't good enough. Well, you tell me, was their faith any... If anything, you think there are people praying for Peter, their faith would have been challenged even more because they just saw James die, right? I mean, to me, that would be make it even more so. And so why did God allow James to be taken and not Peter at this time? Because James fulfilled his service? Okay. I don't see where he says that James was killed in front of the church. James was killed, obviously. Because they said they encouraged Jesus. And that's when the church would send the scripture that the church Right. I just, I come with the assumption that they knew James had been taken because he was a leader and that they were probably praying for him also. Okay. 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 So God's will's part of it. You got something? Yeah. <laughs> yep. He said, "On the on this rock, I'm going to build my church." But that being said, 
See, you had the disadvantage of being in that other class for so long. I'm just kidding. Best class, best class is wonderful. But uh, we talked about how that rock is really the statement Peter made, and it, not so much Peter himself, although he was the one that made the statement as the rock of the statement. But that, but it's certainly there's truth, some truth in that also. Do you have your hand up, Tim? Right. He's part of the bigger plan. Now, let me ask you this. This whole conversation for the last few minutes has been done from a purposefully human perspective. From God's perspective, I'm going to say from James' perspective, at this point in the story, who's got the better existence right now? James or Peter? Right? So in a sense, we would almost reverse the question. Like, why did God not allow Peter the blessing of having his life taken so he could be present with the Lord? I know it's hard to think that way, and I'm not in any way claiming I'm there yet either, but that's really how God wants us to see the Scriptures. That we truly believe that when we are absent from the body, we are present with God, and we are more alive without all the barriers that we have here. And so while it looks like Peter got the better end of it, at this moment in time, really we could argue that James did, right? Yes. So you don't want to say yes, because that's hard. That's <laughs> Yes. Yeah. And that's exciting because that means if you're not taken yet, that whether it was by angelic or by some other means, God has preserved you to be here this moment. Yeah, you got the first deacon, the first bishop. Congratulations, they're going to kill you. <laughs> Glad I'm not the first priest here at Christ Church. No. <laughs> you don't know that. No. No, and you two are just coming at it from, you're both right, and you're both coming from it from different perspectives. But, but you're both actually completely accurate in what you're saying. In that there's something to be said that God took the first deacon and he took the first bishop. But they're a type or a symbol for us as believers of our lives being lived to the fullest until God decides to take us. And it's a very encouraging thing because that means even if our bodies are wasting away, and, and I'll speak bluntly, I forget if I mentioned it last week, excuse me if I did, but uh, two Sundays ago, I sat down with Elaine Powell and you know she has brain cancer and, and, and her body is withering away and yet I watched her give glory to God. I watched her sit there in peace saying, I am ready. She wasn't ready for the process of it, but she was ready. She's ready. And there's something about to our last breath giving a testimony that we are here for God. And that's what uh, James did, what Stephen did, and what Peter is given the opportunity to do for much longer in his life than James. And so we are here, and I just wanted to help us think of that a little differently, that it's actually the promotion that we get into the presence of God and then kind of leave everyone else to, to work through it, work it out down here. So, yes, that's right, Candace. Uh, heaven is the finish line. That's right. And we just keep praying health for you and your whole family as you get through this stuff, folks. All right. So we'll move on to verse 5. Any other questions on any of that before we move on? I know we covered like three different major topics in one short time, but we good? Okay. So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. I'm sure they were. And so they had gathered and they were doing that. And the night before Herod was to bring Peter to trial, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains and sentries stood guard on all sides. You know, have you ever thought, Peter, for being such an aggressive kind of strong personality, we find him sleeping a lot. 
You know, in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus says, wait with me and pray. What's Peter doing? Sleeping. In Acts chapter 10, he's up on the roof. What happens? He's going to go sleep. Here, he's going to die. He, uh, he may know that he's not, but he's prepared to die the next day with all these guards all around him, chained to him. What's he doing? And he's sleeping so soundly that if I can put my own spin on it, the angel has to kind of kick him and be like, get up. <laughs> Come on. He's probably like, another, another 10 minutes, another 10 minutes, you know. And so Peter obviously had that rest of faith that comes. And I was reminded, if you don't mind, just from a verse in, in, in uh, Isaiah 26, where uh, the prophet says, uh, you, will be you will keep in perfect peace him whose mind is steadfast on you, because he trusts in you. So trust in the Lord who is the rock eternal. I mean, what a great verse for us to claim when we're struggling with thoughts and anxiety at night. Or I don't know about you, I usually don't have trouble getting to sleep, but when the anxiety hits, it wakes me up, and then I can't get back to sleep. Some people have trouble getting to sleep. I prayed for a man just uh, last week who's had horrible uh, time getting to sleep. And so this verse is one that we can meditate on and think about. Uh, Isaiah 26, it says, You will keep in perfect peace the one whose mind is steadfast on you because they trust you. Yes, ma'am. Why did what? Oh, yes, because there was a certain time frame when it was inappropriate to have trials. And that's why, if you remember, Jesus' trial was an illegal trial because it happened during the Passover. And so, but here they're waiting till after it to honor that tradition. But yeah, that goes back to a Jesus. Good, good point. I, I missed that. Thanks. Yeah. What? Right. Right, and so and he didn't want, you know, he's trying to appease the Jews, so he doesn't want to get them ticked off because he does it on the Passover and such like that. So that's good. All right, so Peter is here. He's sleeping between two soldiers, bound in chains, and he's just having a wonderful night's nice rest. Good example for us. And suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared, and the light shone in the cell. Oh, just real quick, Merv, praise God. He just wrote, I'm sleeping better. See, you never know who's watching. So i got to be careful who I talk about. Love you, brother. <laughs> Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared. Tell me the purpose of angels. Messengers. They're messengers. Who's messengers? Jesus. Okay. How do we know that? Where? <laughs> Anybody remember where? Very good. She's narrowed it down to Hebrews. Anybody got the chapter? One, chapter one. Very good. Yes. You weren't sure if it was number one or if I was telling you to be quiet. <laughs> in, in Hebrews chapter one, it says in verse eight, but or I'm sorry, verse seven, in speaking of the angels, God says, uh, he makes his angels winds, his servants flames of fire. It's their job to minister to the saints of God. So believe it or not, there are angelic beings who are watching over each one of us. And in fact, in Matthew 18, in case you were ever wondering about this, some of you may have heard about guardian angels and that kind of thing. Is that terminology familiar to people, having a guardian angel and whether each of us have one guardian angel? We have no no definite standard in the scripture that everyone has one guardian angel. Some of us may have multitudes. Greg and I were joking that he and I needed a lot more than everybody else because of who we are, right, brother? And so, but listen to what it says in Matthew 18, 10. See that you do not look down on one of these little ones. It's talking about the children. I'm sorry, the children of God. For I tell you that their angels in heaven will always see the face of my Father in heaven. That was Jesus talking. Meaning that when we are going through things, God has sent angelic support to help us. And when we pray for things, God often responds by releasing his messenger angels to minister in those situations. In fact, I'm going to just give you what's called a tease. That this Sunday, Terry and Greg are going to share something about that in your testimony, right? 
not putting any pressure on you, but you said you were. So now I said it in front of the whole world. So you're going to have to. So anyway, so the, the angelic, I'm joking, but the angelic messengers are there to help us. Amen. Amen. And we know that a couple of angels did what to Sodom and Gomorrah? Destroyed. Destroyed it. They are powerful, powerful beings. As I shared with you last week, they're not little babies with their butts hanging out and little arrows. Okay. That is a false picture of what an angel is. They are mighty powerful warriors who could destroy large portions of this world if they were given uh, a lot if they were asked to by god <laughs> yes stood there and did that yep <laughs> right right and so that those are the power of the angels um and so forth i'm actually looking forward in a few weeks i've decided that I, the, the lord wants me to teach real hard on angels one sunday morning not this sunday but in a couple sundays so i look forward to getting more into that but just realize that god is for you more than just the just one second more than theologically his strongest beings he sends to support you in what you're going through from what we can understand from the scriptures, different angels have different uh, functions or purposes. Just like Gabriel was proclaiming, Michael's known as the warrior angel. If you're hurting, I believe there are angels that are sent to comfort you. If, there, if you need music, no, I'm just kidding, that's playing in the background. But there were healers. And, and so there's all kinds of different purposes to why God sends his angelic help to help us. And so I just want to encourage you that way because the understanding of angels has been so muddied in our modern, really for, for hundreds of years, about their true purpose. And so we don't worship them, right? Every time someone worships an angel in the Bible, they're told they're being foolish, right? Get up, get up, get up. You know, don't do that. We're not there to worship. They are there to serve us, to help us serve our Lord in the way we live. And that should encourage us. I will say, I don't think there's anything wrong with saying, Lord, in my great despair right now, can you send comforting angels? God, can you release your angels of ministry to my friend who's hurting? Uh, it's still God's decision whether to do it, but I don't, you're uh, there. Do you see how you're not praying to the angels with that though? Everybody get that? You're praying to the one true God to ask him to release angels, okay? Certainly, certainly, yes, yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. If anything, he had to wake him up a little. <laughs> he was kind of all relaxed, and so. Mhm. Mm mhm. Mm yep. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Tough. Tough day for them. Hey. <laughs> so uh, we won't go into that, but. Um, Let's continue on. Anybody have any questions on, on angels real quick? I just, like I said, we'll go, I'll go into more detail. I'll be doing more teaching on it in the future. But, uh, okay. So, the angels came. The light, light shone in the cell. Now, realize, who was there with Peter in the cell? Which means just like at the tomb, when the, angelic, when the angels showed up, the power of the presence of God somehow knock them out we don't know i think it's extraordinarily unlikely they fell asleep now they may have been knocked out asleep but i don't think on their own they just all fell asleep that god's presence knocked out the angels and woke up and ministered to his child in that situation That's true. That's true. And so that powerful, but along with the light is the presence. And the, to me, the presence is even more powerful than the light, but you're right. The light is powerful too. And let's be honest, when Jesus showed up to, to Saul on the road, we saw what it did to him. And as far as we know, that was in the daytime. So, yep, that was how strike. Okay. So get up, he said, and the chains fell off Peter's wrists. And this is kind of the fun part. Then the angel said to him, put on your clothes and sandals. And Peter did so. He said, wrap your cloak around you and follow me, as the angel told him. Peter followed him out of the prison. Now, I just want to point out, 
there's a physical prison that Peter couldn't get out of. There was a door of in, un, in, unjust, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Injustice that Peter couldn't get past. But one thing that broke through all of that was the power of God through the power of prayer. And we must never think that the power of prayer is something simple like rub-a-dub-dub, thanks for the grub, bub, and we say it at dinner. The power of prayer truly can move spiritual mountains and physical entities. What no person on earth could do, God did simply by answer to prayer to set this man free for his purposes. So, and so uh, uh, he followed him out of the prison, but he had no idea that what the angel was doing was really, it was really happening. He thought he was seeing a vision. We know Peter sees visions, right? So he thought, okay, I'll just kind of follow along. I'll play this game. It's just a vision. We'll see. Maybe God's showing me what he's about to do. They passed the first and second guards and came to the iron gate leading to the city. It opened for them by itself. That was the first self-opening door. Sure, we have them all the time now at our grocery stores. But that was the first self-opening door that we know of. And so when they had... Oh, I'm sorry, I lost my place with my bad humor. They opened up verse, what verse am I at, 11? 10, thank you. All right, they passed the first and second guards, came to the Iron Gate League, it opened up for themselves, and they went through it. When they had walked the length of one street, suddenly the angel left Peter. And so in that moment, Peter finally realized what was going on, that God was answering. Now let me ask you, have you ever had an experience where you woke up suddenly and immediately you found out some type of good news or great news. It may have been a phone call. It may have been a text. It may have been something you saw. And it just changed your day immediately. It like woke you up. Would you mind sharing for a moment if it's short? Well, thank you for sharing. Absolutely. That God's presence was there. I can tell you as someone who's done ministry with many people who are dying, sometimes it can be a very holy place. I'll just, I'll just leave it. It can be a very holy place. Any, anybody else? It doesn't have to be as traumatic and deep as that, but does anybody have any other circumstances where they woke up, found something out, and they were just up and ready to go? So God prepared you with that peaceful word and you were, so when you saw it come to fruition, you're like, amen. See, mine was a lame one about Dallas Cowboys, so I feel embarrassed to share it now. So I'm not going to share, I'll share it another time. So <laughs> thank you, ladies. That was very deep and penetrating and better than anything I had. So that was good. I share it because when God gets a hold of us, that all of a sudden he can just awaken us with his very presence and know he's with us. And so Peter came to himself and said, Now I know without a doubt that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from Herod's clutches and from everything the Jewish people were anticipating. I am quite certain that the Jewish people, there was quite the hubbub going around town, don't you think? If you knew that he had killed James and now he's got Peter... And he's planning to kill Peter today? I mean, there was probably some serious excitement going up saying, about time, that guy deserves it. This is going to be a good day. There were probably rabbis of the time thinking, all right, we're going to put a squelch this thing and be done with it. Not knowing that God was not finished with Peter in this circumstance. And so what no one could do for him, God did. 
And now we come to this very uh, interesting uh, <laughs> kind of moment. Uh, when, they had, when this had dawned on him, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark. Now, do you remember how Mark's going to be connected in the big picture? Does anybody know? It's in the next chapter, but does anybody remember? Not quite, no. Mark is going to be the one that travels with Barnabas and Paul, or Saul, to be one of the great evangelists at that time. But he's a young guy. He's a, by that point, he's Paul. And he was a young guy. And then we're gonna, he's going to cause quite a problem, a uh, challenge, let's just say, for Barnabas and Paul. Yes, yes it is. Wrote the Gospel of Mark. And so, I, I, people joke a little bit, because if you know the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that Mark's Gospel, he uses this Greek word, which roughly translates, and immediately they went there. And immediately they went there. And immediately, the, it's almost as if someone with ADD wrote the Gospel of Mark, and you learn that he was younger than all the rest, so he was probably just so excited to get to the next part all the time. That's, that part's my guess, but anyway, so... Uh, when, uh, when in dawn, there were many people gathered together praying. Peter knocks at the outer entrance. Now, just real quick. I don't know if any of you have ever done late night prayer times where you're praying late into the night, 1 or 2 a.m. You know, your, your brain starts to get real foggy and you're trying to focus and you drift in and out, right? It happens. Yes, we're all willing to admit that, right? None of us are spiritually beyond falling asleep on God, right? And, and that happens. And so when we read that they were up all night in prayer for Peter, we got to understand that sometimes we read it and we think, how could these people not believe? Well, if you're up on uh, most of the night and you're exhausted and you're groggy and you're struggling because you just saw James killed, you can understand why the people will struggle to really believe what's about to happen. And so we, put, we tend to like to put ourselves in the story, but the best part of ourselves. And so, and not realize where these people were at. This was a very traumatic time where the great leaders of the movement of Christianity looked like they were being taken out one by one. Greg, did you have something? Yeah, yep. Right. It's kind of that, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Once we're on the other side of that valley, it's real easy to look back and go, well, duh. Of course God was going to do that. But when you're down in it, and the sun has ri risen over the other side, and it's dark, it's difficult, isn't it? And so here we have people who are emotionally, I'm sure, exhausted, mentally, spiritually, physically exhausted, praying and begging the Lord to protect this man, not just because he's the head of a ministry, but because they truly love this man, Peter. It's very possible many of them came to the Lord through his ministry. <laughs> he taught them, he ministered to them day in and day out. And so here we have where uh, many of them were praying. And in verse 13, Peter knocked at the outer entrance and a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer the door. When she recognized Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed, she ran back without opening it and exclaimed, Peter's at the door. I'm sorry, it was probably more like, Peter's at the door. That's probably more what it was like. Now, again, when we're at a really good place, it's easy to say in faith, well, go get him, girl, right? But when you're in an emotionally and spiritually depressed, challenged place, it's hard to have hope, isn't it? Especially after as many of them probably were praying for James and did not see God answer. And so here they are, and we shouldn't belittle them because they struggled to believe, because I'm sure we can all see ourselves in this passage at one point in our lives or another where it's really difficult to believe. We can disagree agree to disagree. All right, that's you got the Barnabas one last week. I'll get mine this week, so okay. Uh, anyway, so she recognized Peter's voice and said, Peter's at the door. You're out of your mind, they told her. 
men and women of faith. Isn't it good? You're out of your mind. Right, they're praying. It's like, God, if you would just give this church a million dollars, a million dollars, Lord. Bill comes walking in. So there's a check for a million dollars. Get out of here, you're full of it. Lord, give us a million dollars. It's hard to believe even when God is answering it, isn't it? We got that, all right, good. Didn't take care of that. And so here they are. They don't just say, is it true? They actually say, are you out of your mind? That this servant girl, they think she may have just been emotional. They didn't know what was going on. They said, when she kept insisting it was so, they said, it must be his angel. Now that's an interesting line there. And it shows a slightly inaccurate theology. Okay? Why do you think they said it must be his angel? By saying it must be his angel, what were they implying? He was dead, right? And it's come... <laughs> They did, but it's a slightly inaccurate theology because our loved ones, we never read in the scripture that our loved ones become angels, okay? Angels are different beings than humans, okay? So I just want to be clear about that. And so when an angel, when they say they saw Peter's angel, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to guess that by it they meant the angel that was watching over him. Or is, Right, his angel. And so, the, the, um, and so that's what I'm going to go with there in that moment. It must be his angel. But Peter kept on knocking, and when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. Peter motioned with his hand for them to be quiet and described how the Lord had brought him out of prison. And he says, tell James. Now, this obviously isn't the James who died. This is the other James. The James, if you remember... Now, Greg and I were talking about this in Terry, so I won't let them answer. Do you remember who, what role James was playing in the church at that time? He was kind of the head or bishop of where? Jerusalem, right? So of the, the most important hub, so to speak, James was the one. Remember, they sent the ones in the first place. And so they were to go and tell James and the brothers about this, and he left them for another place. I always find that interesting because that amazing thing just happened. And then it, in the scriptures, they go, eh, then he went somewhere else. <laughs> it like just ends there. It doesn't, I would have loved for like a, at least a couple paragraphs about the interaction between these people and Peter, wouldn't you? I'd love to hear about how Herod, known for his temper, responded when, that, and we're going to learn a little bit about that, but we're not going to learn a lot how all this came out. I would have, it just would have been a beautiful thing to see. Why is it important to testify when God works in our life to other people? It builds faith in who? In us and in God, well, in God, but also in the church, in the people you're sharing your testimony to. Do you know in the scriptures actually says uh, to testify, or this, I'm, I'm not going to quite get it right, but it's like uh, a testimony is the spirit of prophecy, meaning that when I, something, God does something in my life and I share about it. Testimony just means to declare something that God did for you. If I declare it, it has the ability prophetically to build faith in you. And when you share a story with me of how God moved in your life, it has the ability to build faith in me and why it's so important and something I'd love to see more of in our church. Uh, lots of people share things, but I'd love to see people up front sharing the testimonies of God so that we can build faith in one another. There's something that is transmitted spiritually. I wouldn't even try to explain what it looks like or how it works. But when you and I share what God has done, something goes forth. There's a seed that is planted in that person, whether they realize it or not. And that's why sometimes when you share the gospel or you simply tell someone what Jesus did for you, they may laugh at you, they can walk away, they can say, that's nice, that's not for me. But there is now a seed residing in them that they can't get rid of. Now they can ignore it, but there's something that has been planted by God through you and I speaking out the truth of what he's done in our life. So, okay. Please. Right, so James is the brother of John. Right. 
we assume he was a disciple. I, we may have, we may, I, you know, now that I think about it, we may have used the wrong term for the wrong person, a cost. But yeah, so he was simply a disciple who was a leader in that community where, where uh, James, uh, and the James, I'm sorry, what was that? Uh, the disciple James who was martyred was in Caesarea, whereas the other one was dwelled in Jerusalem as the head of the church. Yeah. Uh, yes. And so, and, and the one that uh, led the church in Jerusalem was the one who wrote the book of Leviticus. No, I'm just kidding. James. It was James. Just making sure you're still with me. I feel like I'm losing you a little bit, trying to keep you on your toes. I'm trying to make, I only have a few more minutes. It'll be the first time Jim has not talked and asked a good question during Bible study. I don't know what's going on back there. He must be tired. I don't know. Maybe the angels are ministering to him and he's just getting better than getting more than we are right now. So if that's the case, I'll come hang out with you, brother. So, all right. In the morning, there was no small commotion. Don't you love that? No small commotion was going on. I'm sure it was chaos. Can't you imagine? The Jews are ticked. The Christians and Christian Jews are thrilled. Herod's erupting. And the soldiers are talking and panicked for their life. I mean, it was no small commotion among the soldiers as to what had become of Peter. Could you imagine being that soldier waking up, looking at the guy to your left or right? You're still chained, but the guy in the middle's gone. What a horrific moment that must have been for those guards. Yeah, someone was waiting for that. And so in 19, and Herod had, after Herod had thoroughly ser search made for him, he did not find him. Now you notice God's hand in this. God got Peter out of there fast. I joked a little about how quickly it just says, you know, and then he went on to the next place. But that's because God got him going. Just like God took Mary and Joseph and Jesus and took them to Egypt for a time because he knew what that Herod the Great was going to do to the babies. And so realize, does that mean God is sovereign? Meaning he is able to watch over and control things? Which means we can trust him with what's going on in our lives, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And so I want you to see the beauty of the sovereignty of God that no one can stop. And so after Herod did a thorough search and didn't find him, he cross-examined the guards and ordered to have them executed. He was a horrible, evil man, and he did what he had to do. Because he wasn't about to take blame for this, right? His favorability points just started to go down quite a bit, you know? All right, we just got about 10 minutes and let's finish the death of Herod and then we'll be ready for Paul and Barnabas next week. Then Herod went from Judea to Caesarea and stayed there for a while. He had been quarreling with some of the people of Tyre and Sidon. They now joined together and sought an audience with him. Having secured the support of Blastus, I think that's one of the cooler names in the Bible, isn't it? Just Blastus. Anyway, that's pretty cool. Anyway. And trusted personal servants to the king. They asked for peace because they were dependent on the king's food supply. So it's just simply things that the king was working with the people to try to make a better treaty, to help with food supply, to make their lives better. Just like every politician promising to make your life better, right? <clears throat> so, yes, it is funny. Yes, it is it's sadly funny. But anyway... Uh, on, the on, the day of the uh, on the appointed day, Herod, wearing his royal robes. As I share this, just picture what it looked like. Herod coming out wearing his great royal robes. He sat on his throne and delivered a public address to the people. They shouted, this is the voice of a God, not a man. Now, where in the Old Testament does that happen? Anybody remember? No. I mean, they did believe he was raw and all that, but that, that's not the situation. There was a, a man with a slightly long name named Nebuchadnezzar. Remember him? How he stood in front of the people and said, what have I built? This is amazing. I am amazing. I am like a God. And God did what to him in that moment? Boom. Drove him mad and crazy. And he became like an animal. Okay? And he, they, he was foraging. His son became king. Then he would be found foraging. Now... And what's wonderful about Nebuchadnezzar 
is that if you remember from our study in Daniel, that in the end, what happens to him? He repents and discovers the one true God. And while we don't know for certain that he had yielded his life to the one true God, the evidence seems likely that he did as God restored him in the end in the book of Daniel. But here, why would God strike someone dead just for claiming to have done so great things? He what? <laughs> he took credit for God's work and for being a God. Now, we're going to have a, a good discussion to finish this off here after I read a verse or two. Immediately, because Herod did not give praise to God, an angel of the Lord struck him down, and he was eaten by worms and died. My, now, that is an interesting turn of phrase. Because normally it's they died and the worms, you know? <clears throat> Why do you think they reversed it? Do you think it's just a colorful use of phrase? Or do you think there might be more to it? <clears throat> That's, that is the more likely uh, understanding from scholars. Is that there's... And, and, and please forgive me because I didn't write down all this information because I didn't actually think we'd get like we discussed this, but there is some type of tapeworm in this part of the country that can actually truly devour you from the inside out, causing you to bloat and you can't stop it. And it causes like your entrails to run out. It's a tapeworm we don't have here, but it's in that part of the world at that time. And so many people believe that because he did not honor God, that immediately God struck him with this disease. It's a disease that is found often in cattle and other type of livestock, which was obviously what they ate and what they, they raised and everything else. And because of that, that disease ate through his whole body and killed him. Now, my question for you is, why did God choose to, first of all, let Nebuchadnezzar still live when he called out that he was a god? Why did he kill Herod for claiming to be a god? And why does he not kill leaders today? And I'm not just saying in America, I mean anywhere in the world, dictators, whoever. Why does he not kill leaders today who claim to be like godlike? I don't know. I don't know my Haitian history. Okay. Okay. So why does God not do that to every leader or dictator or politician that dares to usurp God's power and think that they're greater than anyone else? <laughs> we would just go through people too fast. <laughs> yes, give it some time. <laughs> That's one option that we would have no leaders anywhere. Then what do you do, right? Anyone else? I think in some cases it is. Certainly in Nebuchadnezzar's it was. God in his sovereignty, remember when I drew out that line on stage, that he knew in his sovereignty Nebuchadnezzar would repent. And so God was loving and long-suffering for the sake of the repentance so that he could be connected to Nebuchadnezzar. So that answer is correct at least some of the time. Has to be from that scripture reference. The what? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And most of their wives... Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, <laughs> okay, I'm, I, I wasn't there. I don't have the auto recording. I'll have to find it. <laughs> so let, let me help you get where I'm, where I'm going. It's, it's the exact opposite of what we discussed earlier. James and Peter. We asked, why did God allow James to die and Peter to get free. And we decided that, at least from what I think we got from our discussion, was that it was an act of mercy for James that he got to go be with the Lord and that Peter was, though one day that would happen, it was prophesied, would then have to continue to minister. I would offer it's a bit of the reverse here in this case. That why would God allow some politicians to die and some to live on? 
why do you think before I, I I'm kind of trying to lead us there maybe I'm not doing a good job of it that's very possible <laughs> to give an opportunity for repentance in God's sovereignty he may also know just like he knew with Peter that Peter had a purpose still and that James had fulfilled his calling God seems to love to use pagans heretics and God haters to bring about his purpose isn't that true it seems to be his way, right? He used Pharaoh to set the people free, right? And so God seems to like to use unusual people to accomplish his plans. And so it's very possible, one, what you folks said, that God's showing mercy knowing they will come. Because let's be honest, if you take politician A and he spends or she spends their entire lives hating God and doing things that hurt his purposes, but in the end, they yield their life to Jesus Christ. We'll just say for the last year of their life. Would you not think that was God's mercy letting that person live? Right? And so even though we had to put up with the other, God in his mercy cared for that individual. And so I simply want to just kind of point out, and it's getting kind of muddled right now, I don't mean it to, but just that sometimes God knows enough is enough. And for his glory, he's going to take someone out. We do not have the right to pray for God to do that. Okay? James and John did it one time. Hey, can we call down fire from heaven? Or it was the sons of Zebedee. Can we call down fire from heaven? And Jesus rebuked them. Remember? <laughs> right. Right. And bless those who persecute you. Right. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think you're right, but I, I don't want to say for sure. But without question, he sent the warrior angel to say done, right? And wipe out Herod and take Herod out. So last verse, and then we'll be done for tonight. But notice it says in verse 24, but the word of God did what? <laughs> Tell me it would not encourage the church tremendously. They just saw James die. They had to wonder what God was doing. Peter was supposed to die. God sends an angel, saves Peter, not long after, takes out Herod in front of everybody. That's going to build your faith, isn't it? That the very one who thought he was in control found out in the end he had no control at all. And I kind of chuckle when I think he couldn't even control his bowels because a tapeworm was just eating right through him. And so I probably shouldn't laugh about that. <laughs> Right. <laughs> yep. And so, and so it shows how from the beginning God is in control of all that. <laughs> now there is one more Herod mentioned in the Bible. I haven't studied historically past the scriptures, so I don't know. But the last Herod will be mentioned. Uh, Herod Agrippa II in Acts 25. Paul will come before him. Um, after that, I've not studied out the Herods enough to have a, a right answer for you. I, have it in, I know where I have it in my book, but you might be right. Yeah, you might be right. So I, I didn't bring that book over with me. And so, uh, yeah. All right. When Barnabas and Saul, isn't it funny how they just flipped it right there? You notice that? We just talk about Peter delivered from prison. Herod dies next. And Barnabas and Saul had finished their mission. They returned from Jerusalem, taking with them John, also called Mark. In the movies, that's what's called foreshadowing. Just remember the name Mark over the next couple chapters, okay? He's a wonderful example of God's mercy we're going to find. And so from now on, friends, we are going to move forward and learn about Paul and Barnabas, how they split up, and Paul's different missionary um, things they go on. Next week I'll have a printout of the three missionary journeys of Paul so you might want to keep in your Bible so that when, as we're discussing this you can kind of watch how it's going along. And though we won't jump obviously into the whole book, I'll let you know that you know this part of Acts is where Paul probably wrote Galatians or here on the missionary journey he wrote Romans so that you can connect in your Bible in Acts where, God, where Paul most likely wrote the different books. And what it will do for you 
if you allow it, is make those books of the Bible that Paul wrote come alive because you'll see the circumstances behind what caused him to write them when you mix Acts and his, what's called his epistles, his letters, together. Sound good? Well, you got 30 seconds. Do as you please. All right. Thank you, everybody. Have a blessed night. Uh, and I will see you hopefully all next week as we jump into Acts chapter 13.